I have been in a relationship for the past few years. Certainly not long by some standards, but he did propose a few weeks ago, so I feel like we got a pretty good thing going on. <laughs> About a year ago, we were heading to a movie down the road here in Assembly Square. We were running a bit late and trying to find parking in that parking lot that never seems to have any spaces. My partner was driving, and about three floors up, I shouted out, I see a spot. He responded immediately, that's not a spot. No, it's a spot, I said. It's not a spot. I can see it's not a spot. And he turned and went up to the next level. At which point, I made a tiny leap. Why don't you ever listen to me? <laughs> don't you trust me? And when we eventually did find a parking spot, I refused to see the movie until we trudged down two flights of stairs and I showed him the spot that I saw. And when we arrived at that fateful parking spot, I declared triumphantly, see, it's still empty, and I was right. At which point, my partner turned to me somewhat surprised and said, oh, that's the spot you saw? I thought you were looking at that handicapped par parking spot over there. So it turns out we weren't even looking at the same spot. And to make matters worse, because of where we were sitting in the car, there was actually a pole blocking our view so that neither of us could actually see the other person's spot. And as we walked somewhat chagrined into the movie, I realized that during that entire conversation, neither of us had asked a single question. On that note, I feel I should introduce myself. I help people communicate for a living. <laughs> And I've worked in Lebanon and Israel-Palestine and here in the United States, helping people have conversations that feel impossible about all the topics that people tell us to avoid in polite conversation. Politics, religion, race, sexuality. And yet, it took about five seconds for that conversation with my partner to escalate from a parking spot to a full-on inquisition. And I promise, I'm actually pretty good at my job most days. But, it's so easy, though, for all of us to fall into these traps, and our communication just evolves, especially in the face of any stress. Most of us have experienced conversations where we've kicked ourselves afterwards for how we've acted, or times we felt frustrated or unheard, and mad that we couldn't find the right thing to say at the right time. What I've discovered, though, is that we can do better. It's possible to shift how we communicate, to avoid those frustrations, invest in our relationships, and ultimately improve outcomes. Now, I didn't start my career focusing on communication. I came to the Fletcher School at Tufts to study the complexity of foreign policy and religious conflict, imagining that I would spend my career analyzing and providing policy recommendations around the interplay of identity and politics on the international stage. As part of my research, I spent a summer in Lebanon interviewing religious leaders to understand their perspectives towards American foreign policy in the region. Now, in Lebanon, religion and politics are inextricably intertwined, with the government actually split along religious lines as a result of the agreement that ended civil war in 1990. That means that political parties are distinct because of what religion they represent rather than the policies they promote. For instance, Hezbollah is the largest Shia political party, and in the south of Lebanon, they manage roads, infrastructure, jobs, security, and education. So it's tough for American policymakers to navigate seemingly contradictory priorities in Lebanon, because on the one hand, for the Department of State, Lebanon is still a relatively functioning democracy, and we really want to promote democracy in the Middle East. And on the other hand, the Department of Defense is most concerned about security, and they still see Hezbollah first as a terrorist organization. So how do you promote democracy and peace while treating one of the main political parties as a terrorist organization? And how do you ensure security while also promoting democracy in this context? Now, there are incredibly intelligent people working in these areas, and often with the best of intentions. But American policy is still perceived as contradictory and confusing, and it's easy to assume that the Department of State and Department of Defense rarely communicate to navigate these differences. And when I spoke with religious leaders in Lebanon, I heard one common theme from every single person I interviewed. Americans just don't understand this country. I realized that before we can form effective policy in these areas, 
we need to transform how we communicate across differences, internally and externally. That realization became a pivotal turning point in my career. I shifted from trying to, fo to form nuanced analysis to instead focusing on how people communicate across difference. And when I took a closer look, I began to see the frustration I heard in Lebanon echoed outside conflict resolution as well. This gap in understanding and communication impedes our teams, communities, and relationships too. I realized that we needed to transform how we communicate at every aspect of our lives. We now know, for instance, that more diverse teams experience financial returns above industry averages, more innovation, and more careful decision making. But at the same time, we know that employees in tech are twice as likely to leave a company because of unfair treatment as they are because they were recruited by another employer. When the culture of a company doesn't welcome the diversity in thinking, experience, and identity, retention rates suffer, costing companies an estimated $16 billion per year. And when it comes to relationships, John Gottman and his team can, accurate, can predict and foreshadow a culture's future likelihood of divorce with 94% accuracy based solely on how they manage conflict. So how we, how we communicate matters, and yet so few of us pay attention to how we communicate, especially in those difficult moments. So if so much of our lives depends on good communication, why is it so hard? Well, it turns out we're only human. We've developed a set of survival skills that have been enormously helpful for us when dealing with threat as a species. On a biological level, we've evolved so that when we're confronted with something threatening, our chemicals and muscles are activated in a way that allows us to survive. When we're protecting our physical safety, we, don't wanna, we have to make quick judgments. We don't want to have to do an analysis of whether that lion running towards us is hungry or whether they're just out for some exercise. We have to make quick judgments, and we have to respond immediately. That's that fight, flight, or freeze mechanism kicking in. Now, what's interesting is that when it comes to communication in our relationships, our brains respond exactly the same way when we feel our beliefs and identities are being threatened. In that parking garage, my partners and I's assumptions escalated immediately from that's a parking spot to why don't you trust me? <laughs> and that's somebody that I love. So when we're positioned against a group of people that we already think is wrong, it's so easy for all of us to devolve into those old, self-perpetuating cycles of argument and escalation. But what if there was another option? What if we could recognize when those survival mechanisms are no longer serving us in our relationships, teams, and communities? What if we could disagree or see things differently in a way that led to both stronger relationships and stronger outcomes? What if we could be resilient in the face of those threats or challenges, or prevent those kinds of attacks altogether? What if, instead of reacting automatically, we could take a step back and just ask, what parking spot are you looking at? We can shift these things by being more intentional with how we communicate, especially in difficult moments. Think for a moment about the last presentation you attended. Hopefully, the person leading that presentation prepared. There might have been a syllabus, an agenda, or some sort of preparatory reading. The presenter likely shared their content, asking for discussion or feedback, or maybe opening up the space for some conversation. In most of the group conversations I observe, the same three to five people take up the vast majority of that conversation. The same people raise their hands and respond to questions, and often they give only the information the presenter wanted to hear. Meanwhile, everyone else thinks about what's for lunch, or checks Twitter, or drafts an email in, res in response to that really annoying question a coworker asked this morning. In situations like these, so few presenters actually pay attention to how the conversation happens. For instance, what if a presenter asked a question and allowed everybody to respond about the implications of the reading on their perspectives of the topic? What if after asking a question, a presenter gave a minute for everyone to think and reflect to ensure that people of all learning styles could fully participate and respond? 
I'm proposing that changing how we communicate can be the intervention that builds both better relationships and better outcomes. That when we face a problem in the future, in addition to thinking about all those tangible interventions like incentives, punishments, education, or action, we can also intervene by designing a different kind of conversation. And we can do that outside of formal presentations as well. We can design different conversations with our families, friends, and relationships too. For example, we could agree to speaking limits or just to not interrupting each other. We could take time to reflect or prepare before a conversation to help ensure that everyone shows up intentionally to that conversation. To slow things down, we could begin to take a breath between speakers. When everyone knows they'll have an opportunity to speak, they'll be less likely to jump in the second there's a break or frustrated when the conversation has moved on before they've had a chance to form their argument. I'm advocating that we need to change something we do automatically every single day. We need to transform how we communicate at every single level because we can't afford to take our communication for granted anymore, even if these tools do sound artificial. So whether you're navigating a peace process in Lebanon or talking about a parking spot with your partner or teaching a class on stem cell research here at Tufts, we need to change how we communicate at every level. So the next time you need to ask a question, think about asking a question that can lead to new information or invite somebody to speak from their own experience or expertise. And when you listen, pay attention to what you're listening for. Are you listening to find holes in their argument, to respond with a better punchline, to show them just how wrong they are? Instead, can you listen with open-mindedness, curiosity, and resilience? All of us think about whether we have the right answer, but so few of us think about whether we have the right question. Is it possible you're not even talking about the same parking spot? How we communicate impacts every aspect of our lives. It's time we started paying attention to it. Thank you. <laughs>